right now. Good morning, everyone. I'm Brandon Fess with the Local History and Genealogy Division, the Rochester Public Library. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation of Morning in the Morning. Rochester was the center of national attention in November 1872 with the arrest of Susan B. Anthony for voting in the election. Just days into the same year, the city was in the national spotlight for more sinister reasons. Following an arrest for a brutal attack on a young girl, a riot ensued, tinged by race and ethnicity. Monroe County Sheriff Joseph Campbell, determined to ensure due process, called out the militia. The resulting mayhem became national news. Our presenter today is Dennis Carr. Dennis is a founding member, past president, and current trustee of the Friends of Mount Hope Cemetery. He's the senior tour guide at Mount Hope, with 2022 marking his 44th year leading tours of Mount Hope Cemetery. Dennis is also on staff at the Edward G. Minor Library at the University of Rochester Medical Center, assisting students, researchers, clinical staff, and faculty. He's a lifelong scholar of the American Cemetery. Ladies and gentlemen, Dennis Carr. Hello. Well, this, this topic, the Rochester riot, um, and I've got the, the New York Times article from the 4th of January, 1872. Uh, this is where I found out about it. It's, 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 it's not really, it wasn't really, uh, it hasn't really been written about much. And uh, um, I, at the time that I, I was working on a tour called Mischief, Murder and Mayhem that we do at the cemetery, even now, and uh, um, I had access to the New York Times uh, archive. So I, I began looking for, um, looking through there with keyword, keyword searches and uh and this this rochester riot popped up and then i looked at some local local history sources and 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 found found a little bit, a little bit more about it but most of what we know about it comes from the newspapers of the day and uh um normally if you say rochester riot people automatically think of 1964 and the, the riots in the city then but, uh, but this riot was a, was a pretty big event in the history of Rochester. And uh, I think it opened, opens a window on, on life in the city and, and uh, uh, ideas about law enforcement and, uh, and maybe even race and ethnicity as well. So the incident occurs on Saturday, December 30th, 1871. And a, a little girl, a 10 year old girl named Cecilia Oaks, O-C-H-S, um, she lived on, on uh, um, Francis Street, which is there. It, it, it runs off from the intersection of Cottage and uh, um, Cottage Street, and I think that's uh, Plymouth Avenue. And uh, not even sure if it's still there, but, uh, but she and her parents and uh, uh, two siblings, two older siblings, lived on at uh, 72 Francis Street. And uh, uh, that day, they were outside. She was outside with another little girl uh, close to their home. And uh, um, this man came up and asked for directions and uh, um, sort of convinced her that he would, wouldn't be able to find it if she didn't go with him. And she did. And uh, um, he, he got her over by the river and uh, brutally attacked her, sexually assaulted her and, and beat her up pretty good and, uh, um, and, and left her there. She was able to get herself together enough to, to get into a place where, where people might see her. And, and she was assisted by, by a man named Mr. Chapin who uh, brought, brought her to his own home and uh, uh, left her there and uh, went for the police. Uh, the police came down and they, they, they took this very seriously, as you can imagine. Uh, the police came down and they, they began questioning people. They questioned a little girl. And uh, uh, they determined that, uh, that the perpetrator was an African-American man uh, named William Henry Howard. And uh, he was known to the police. And uh, he had been spotted in the neighborhood by a number of people, as it turned out. And, and some of them had seen him 
uh, with this little girl. And the, the, I would be concerned in the day we live in, I would be concerned about uh, uh, an African-American man being accused of, of a crime in 1872. Uh, but I think the, I think the identifications were, were, were pretty accurate. Uh, some of the people that, that identified him were familiar with him. He, he had actually, although he, he said that he had been nowhere near the eighth ward. This was part of the eighth ward at that time. Said he had been nowhere near the eighth ward on that day. But it turns out that, that uh, William Henry Howard, he's about 23, he, uh, he, dressed, he dressed in, a, in a, a very distinctive way. He, he wore, for the day, pretty flashy clothing. Uh, and, and people noticed it. And they noticed him on uh, December 30th. And uh, 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 he... Uh, he wore, he wore striped, striped pants and a striped vest and a, 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 a very distinctive hat. And uh, uh, so, so people were, were able to identify him after the fact. He had stopped in a store on Hunter Street, which is, which is nearby. And uh, uh, the proprietor of the store was, uh, had knew him and identified him and said that he had been in the store that day around the time of this, of this incident. Uh, this happened around, uh, around 11 o'clock in the morning. And Howard was seen by multiple people in the area at that time. And uh, he, he, he probably heard that the police were after him and he, sort of, he certainly knew that he had committed this crime. And he, he tried to escape. And uh, depending on the newspapers you read, and, uh, and the sources you read, uh, there are initially different ideas about what happened. And some have him getting on a train at the New York Central Station. It, it turns out that he, he went to Penfield. He went down into that Dugway area out, up near North Landing Road, where there was a small community of African-Americans, including uh, David Wyckoff and his family. Uh, his family lived lived down there. He was a uh, Civil War veteran that uh, uh, um, passed for white most of the time. And uh, so the police, I think this incident, to me, uh, points up some efficiencies in the police department. In a day when we're constantly critical, the police were able to, the city police were able to track this guy down. They questioned a number of people, and uh, um, on Sunday night, the 31st, they, uh, with, with several officers, they went down into the Dugway area, uh, uh, surrounded the house, knocked on the door. The occupants of the house let them in, and uh, they were able to apprehend uh, a William Howard at that time. And uh, when they came out, um, they, they, they it took a while. They, they, they took him, this was late in the day on, on Sunday. Uh, they had, they brought him to the, to the police station on, uh, Monday morning at, at about eight o'clock. And the, the police station was on front street. This is a picture of the police station in the old center market and the uh, police headquarters and the police court were in one wing and some of the militia, uh, units uh, were headquartered in, in in other parts of the building, and this served as the as the as the main police station in Rochester until 1873. And uh, uh, so they 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 questioned him there at the police station, and then they 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 took him they took him to Francis Street. They wanted to uh, they wanted to uh, have have this little girl identify him. Uh, today, I think things would be done a lot, a lot differently, of course, but uh, they, they went to Francis Street, went to the house where, her, where she and her family lived, and uh, uh, the police detective, and uh, there were two detectives uh, that worked on this, and, and uh, several officers went along. They uh, um, had, had Howard in custody. And uh, uh, they went into the house and, and 
one of the officers asked Cecilia Oakes if she remembered what the man looked like. And, uh, uh, and then he cleared, the, he cleared the room and he brought, in, he brought in William Howard for her to identify. Must have been highly traumatizing to this little girl who had been assaulted. And, uh, uh, but she identified it. And you, you might say that uh, a 10 year old girl who had been traumatized might not be a, a reliable witness, but I think uh, there are uh, there extenuating circumstances. The day before on Sunday, the police had arrested an African-American man who they suspected of this crime. And they brought him to the house and the little girl that was that had been playing with Cecilia said, "That's not the man." And when that when 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 they brought him into Cecilia's room, she said that he was not the man that assaulted her. So the following day, when they bring in William Howard, both Cecilia and her friend are sure that this man is is the man that assaulted her. So uh, that, and given the fact that he was seen in the neighborhood by people who recognized him, seen with, with this little girl, it seems like the identification is, is valid. Uh, so they, uh, from, uh, from Francis Street, they took, him, they, they took him back to the jail. And the jail was on, uh, the jail was on Exchange Street. And, uh, this, this, is, uh, this is Exchange, this is Court Street right here, the jail is right here, and this is the yard for the jail. This is the, uh, what, what, was, what was referred to as the Blue Eagle Jail, built in 1832. It served as the, as the county jail until 1885. And there's a picture of it from the Broad Street Bridge. And uh, uh, this is the jail right here. And it sits on a piece of land that's divided by a, a, a mill race from the main main area, and there is you can you can see there's uh, hard to hard to see in the picture, but this is a this is a lumber yard, and on the other side of the property was another lumber yard, and that comes into play as things develop. Um, when the when the two detectives brought. William Howard out of the house on Francis Street after he had been identified, uh, a number of people had had uh, crowded around the house, and uh, as they brought him out, uh, they 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 began to attack Howard, and uh, uh, he was handcuffed to a, to a uh, a police officer uh, named McCormick, and. Uh, there he is, Charles McCormick, who became a captain in 1885. He was a, he was a patrol officer at that time. And he is uh, handcuffed to William Howard. And the newspaper surmised that, that, that people may have been more violent had he not been handcuffed to, uh, to, McCor to Officer McCormick, because if, it, if they had hurt Howard, they would have hurt McCormick. But uh, one of the detectives, Detective Hughes, pulled out his revolver and, uh, and announced that uh, anybody that came near them would be shot. So the crowd allowed them to, uh, although Howard was hit several times, they allowed them to, uh, to leave the area. And a lot of these people, a lot of these people went to the jail straight from there, some followed and, uh, Police Chief, uh, Police Chief Sherman, there he is, Samuel Sherman. Uh, he he and, a, and a, a number of officers met these detectives with the prisoner uh, at the corner of, of Hunter Street, which which runs runs in that area, runs between Magnolia Street and uh, I, I I think Plymouth Avenue. Plymouth, it goes over to Genesee Street actually. So they 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 meet they meet the chief of police and his his officers uh, nearby, and they they swiftly get Howard over to the jail. By this time, a crowd is forming around around the Monroe County Jail, and uh, um, so by the time the sheriff got 
got there, and the sheriff was responsible for this. Uh, the sheriff uh, had in the jail, he had the deputy jailer's wife and two officers inside, inside the jail at the time that they're, be, between the time they've interviewed the prisoner and, and, uh, and uh, had him identified and the time they get him to the jail. So there's only, there's, there's two men and the, the jailer's wife uh, at the jail. And this crowd is, is, is starting to gather around, around the jail. And when, when uh, Sheriff Joseph Campbell arrived, and we, I'm sure there are pictures of, of, of Sheriff Campbell someplace, but I wasn't able to, uh, I wasn't able to find any in, in, on the quick, but uh, Sheriff Campbell uh, goes to the jail and the crowd moves in on him. And he, he, he's pressed up against, up, up against the, the, the wall to the, uh, to the jail. And there it is. So, so they've got him pressed up, pressed up against, against the door here. And, uh, and they've already breached the yard here. This, the yard is where um, they would have, you can see the yard. These are the doors. This is the yard. Hangings would have occurred in that yard and they, and they did. Uh, but they've already breached, they've already breached the, the uh, gate into that yard and they're, they're, they're uh, pressing onto the building. They're, they're, they're they're hitting the building with with bats and throwing bricks at the building, and uh, when the when the uh, when the de when more deputies arrived, the, the the jailer's wife wouldn't let them in. She she didn't recognize them right away, so she wouldn't let them in. So these deputies are, and the sheriff are on the outside, uh, trying to beat back this crowd, and uh, uh, and not having not having much success. Uh, some of the city police arrived, but as uh, as uh, police chief uh, Sherman related to the sheriff, that uh, there, were, there were about 65 Rochester policemen at that time, and uh, uh, the majority of them had had uh, had been on the night watch, and so so uh, Chief Sherman told the sheriff that uh, he didn't think that they could. Uh, that they could be of much help because because his force was was much reduced. Not so sure that would be a, a good excuse today, but uh, um, uh, Chief Sherman had other problems. But uh, but but he did send the people that he could, and uh, so through the day, this crowd this crowd grew and grew, and uh, they're calling out. You can imagine the words they're using. Uh, they want they want the prisoner Howard uh, brought out, and, and they were going to lynch him. And uh, the papers reported, and once again, depending on the papers that you read, um, the papers are reporting that that the people that were closest to the jail, and the people that were were actually throwing bricks and and bats and things like that, uh, they they identified as many of them as German Americans and, and the Oaks family were part of the German American community. And that's, that probably explains that because Rochester was not that big a, a city at that time. There are about, about, uh, there were about 80,000 people in Rochester in 1872. Not, not, not even that. It's probably, it's less than that. It's because when, when Susan B. Anthony was tried for voting, I believe that there were, a little over 60,000 people. So, so it's more like 60,000 people. Uh, a lot of people knew other people in town. So uh, uh, people would have identified many of these people. But then the secondary problem was all, all in this area, uh, people came just to see what was going on and, and you know, concerned about it. Maybe you're just curious, but, uh, but another crowd gathered. And so once again, the, the numbers are hard to pin down, but the, uh, the coroner's inquest on, on the 9th of January uh, estimated that there, was, there were about, about a thousand people uh, pressing in on the jail and that there may have been maybe, maybe uh, several more thousand just hanging around in the neighborhood. So uh, um, you can see here, this is, this is uh, a, a this is a uh, an illustration from Frank Leslie's uh, newspaper, and uh, um, 
I don't really think it, it represents the area uh, perfectly, but, uh, but it, it's, it shows a lot of people. Here's the, uh, here's the uh, militia and the police. Uh, the police are up front, the militia is behind, and they're trying to press back the crowd. That would have been, that would have been happening on the third, uh, uh, early on the third. So on the late late in the afternoon on the on the on the second, the sheriff called out called out uh, two militia companies, and uh, and seeing the crowd gather, they ended up with they ended up with an entire regiment of militia. This would be this would be comparable to our present day National Guard, and uh, and and these are people that that work in the community. They would have known many of the people that they were there to. Um, disperse, and they and many of those many of those militia members would have known the Oaks family and other people in the German American community. So it's a complicated situation, but they they performed pretty pretty uh, admirably um, under some pretty trying circumstances. Uh, a number of those militiamen were injured in this in this riot, and and. Uh, uh, many of them injured beyond the point of, of being able to uh, to participate in, in the in protecting the jail, but uh, uh, the sheriff brought in as many people as he could. Each town and village in Monroe County, and each section of the city had constables, and uh, uh, the constables many times were elected officials, but they were also uh, responsible for law enforcement. They were they were considered special deputies under the sheriff's department, and uh, uh, many of these constables came into the city to to assist the sheriff in protecting the jail. Uh, in particular, the uh, the coroner's inquest mentions the, the the constable from Spencerport who happened to be in town and uh, and came to the jail and spent most of this time inside the jail helping to making sure that that the, that the jail wasn't breached um, a reporter uh, two reporters from the Democrat and Chronicle on the 3rd of January uh, went to the jail and visited uh, William Howard and they described him as as uh, maybe the most fearful person they'd ever laid eyes on he no longer had the flashy clothes he had been uh, his clothes had been confiscated as evidence in, by the by the sheriff's deputies, and he was he was dressed in a a, a a gray outfit that prisoners wore, but he was also his 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 hands were still manacled and his uh, his his legs were were uh, manacled so that he couldn't uh, couldn't attack anybody. Number one, because he had tried to escape several times already, and uh, uh, and also I think they. They knew that if he got out of the out of the cell, that uh, he was as good as dead if he if he left the jail. So they, uh, um, and and he was very aware. The reporters said of of what was going on out outside the jail, and so uh, understandably understandably afraid. So on uh, well, okay. On the third, late on the late on the third, uh, the people in the crowd, the people in the immediate crowd here, uh, began throwing uh, bricks and bats and all sorts of things. As I said, a uh, number of deputies were 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 injured, and uh, uh, number of a number of the militia people were injured. And so, uh, Colonel Westcott, who who was the regimental commander of the militia in town. He ordered the uh, he ordered a unit to uh, push the crowd back, and they they tried, but there were only I think there were no more than fifteen of them, and they 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 were unable to make any progress. So he he called up uh, uh, several other units, and they were able to press that crowd back back into the lumber yard uh, to the north. And uh, uh, beyond beyond the mill race, and then uh, Colonel Westcott uh, uh, assigned troops to clear the Court Street Bridge because many of these people were coming across the Court Street Bridge, which which meant they could they could come right in uh, uh, 
without having to cross the mill race. So he put, they pushed the crowd all the way back to, uh, across the Court Street Bridge and back to uh, South Avenue. And that was helpful. Uh, but they had to maintain this and, and it wasn't easy. And they, they kept having to continually push this crowd back. Sometime on the third, sometime late in the day on the third, as these people are uh, throwing things, uh, some shots were fired from the crowd and, and they didn't hit anybody. They were, they were, they were fired over the, over the heads of the militia and over the heads of the deputies. They struck, they struck the building. And uh, um, at that point, you can imagine the, the militiamen are, are starting to be very concerned. And uh, uh, one of the militiamen was hit by a, a brick. His gun went off apparently. And these guys are carrying muskets, the type of things that were carried in the Civil War. And his, his, uh, his musket went off. And uh, a, a great number of other militiamen uh, thought that an order had been given and they fired it at the crowd. Uh, about 11 people were, 11 people uh, were hit and, and not killed. Two more people were hit and died. Uh, uh, Henry Merlot, who's buried in Mount Hope Cemetery. Henry Malo was a 19-year-old uh, cabinet maker. And by all accounts, uh, from the police chief and the sheriff and a, a lot of people that were, were on the scene, Henry Malo had nothing to do with this. He was, he was uh, pretty far back. He was probably up beyond Court Street in the area where the, uh, the front of the current uh, Hall of Justice is today. And probably on his way home from work, and he had stopped there to, as, as many people did, to uh, see what was going on and to do a little rubbernecking. And uh, he was hit pretty squarely in the chest and, and died within, within minutes. Another man named John Elter, who was also back up in this area on, on Exchange Street, um, he was hit and uh, he didn't die until, until the following day. They, the doctors thought that he would live. He in fact did die. And uh, um, you can imagine at that point, the crowd dispersed pretty quickly. And uh, uh, it wasn't too long after that, that the sheriff dismissed most of the, most of the, the militia. He had, them, he had them still guard the Court Street Bridge. By this time, he had deputies coming in from, from all over the county and uh, city police officers who were able to uh, also come in and uh, help protect the jail. On the night of the 4th, um, Howard was taken to the county courthouse at midnight. And uh, that is the second Monroe County Courthouse. Uh, um, and this, this served as the county courthouse until the, uh, the current one was built in the, I believe the 1890s. And uh, um, courts were there. And in the, uh, the court that's equivalent today to the uh, state Supreme Court, uh, uh, the state constitution hadn't been changed by that time. So the courts are, are different than they are today. But in, in the, the, the criminal court in, in, in the county courthouse, uh, William Howard was tried for his crime. Uh, the trial lasted about an hour. They had blacked out the windows so nobody could see what was going on. And, uh, uh, the jury returned a verdict in short order, and uh, and they sentenced William Howard to 29 years in in Auburn prison. And uh, he had already served time in prison. Uh, he was a very troubled guy. He had, he had been in trouble a lot. Um, I I I factor in ideas of race and ethnicity at that time, and uh, he seems to have had a, a troubled life, uh, but uh, didn't work, hadn't, hadn't worked to anybody's knowledge. His mother supported him and, uh, and he lived uh, maybe a little too lavish lifestyle for somebody who didn't work. But he was sentenced to 29 years in uh, um, Auburn and uh, um, he was, he was uh, put in a carriage. He was dressed in dark clothing so nobody could see his face. He and two deputies uh, got into a carriage outside the court. 
and they immediately left the city. They went to, as it turns out, Honeoy Falls of all places. And I, I, for a long time, I wondered why would they go to Honeoy Falls? And uh, it turns out that I, I just found out last week why they, why they went to Honeoy Falls. Honeoy Falls uh, was a, a mill town and a, a, had some small manufacturing going on there. And uh, it also had two railroads that, that crossed each other there, the Lehigh Valley and the New York Central. So uh, people in Honeoy Falls uh, would say that you, you could basically go anywhere from Honeoy Falls. And so uh, to get him to Auburn, the most efficient uh, place they could do that without, uh, without uh, people knowing that, uh, that, that a prisoner was there ready to get on a train was to take him to Honeoy Falls. And that probably took uh, probably took four or five hours to get him out there. We got him on a train, got him on a New York Central train to, to, to Auburn. And uh, he was uh, probably the most relieved person to get to Auburn prison, which looked like that, uh, pretty much like that in 1872. That, that's a picture from about 10 years earlier, but, but it's pretty much what the prison looked like in, 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 in the early 1870s. And uh, uh, he spent, uh, actually spent, seven years at, in Auburn prison. And uh, um, on the seventh, and during the seventh year he was there, um, he, he was assaulted by two other prisoners, thrown off the fourth tier, which is, which is up here, and fell to his death at the, at the, at the base of the, the prison cells. And he's buried, he was buried in, in the Auburn Prison Cemetery on Fitch Avenue in Auburn. Now that cemetery is no longer there. In uh, 1931, the prison cemetery was moved to uh, uh, New York State Cemetery land in Seneca, New York. And in, it, 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 but in 2016, the bones of an additional 150 individuals were found uh, it, in the area that had been, been the Fitch Avenue Cemetery. They were removed to the Marcy Correctional Facility in, in, in Marcy, New York. Now today, Auburn Prison has space in uh, uh, Sewell Cemetery, which is, which is halfway between Auburn and Skinny Atlas. And, and uh, part of that cemetery is reserved for Auburn Prison. And they, uh, there are no gravestones in, in that cemetery on the on the uh, prison lot, there are uh, uh, small small markers with with numbers on them, and there's there's a lot of discussion about uh, some of those prisoners' graves because uh, um, there also were prisoners that they think were moved into Fort Hill Cemetery in uh, in Auburn, and uh, uh, particularly the the grave of Leon Golgosh, who who was the assassin that that. Uh, assassinated William McKinley, the president, in 1901. He was buried in, in the Fitch Avenue Cemetery. Um, and uh, they, think he, they think his remains were moved. There wasn't much left because high profile prisoners, uh, uh, they were, it sounds terrible, but they were, their, their bodies were dissolved in lye before they were placed in the grave. So there wouldn't be much left of him, but they think they think he was reinterred in uh, in an area of uh, Fort Hill Cemetery, and I think they were some of those some of those type prisoners. They were always concerned about uh, somebody desecrating their graves, and uh, um, I've said this before. The uh, um, there's a the serial killer at the uh, Columbian Exposition in 1893 in Chicago. He's buried in Graceland Cemetery um, under twelve tons of concrete because they were concerned that somebody might uh, might desecrate his grave. So the, they were concerned about that sort of thing. Um, what happened to some of these people? Uh, Samuel Sherman, he, uh, he was forced to resign as chief of police in 1873 uh, for uh, what they politely referred to as a, a lapse in judgment. The lapse in judgment was that he was uh, he was not uh, not cleaning up all the gambling that happened in the city, and and there were plenty of people in town that thought that he was warning the gambling establishments ahead of his raids. So he resigned in 1873, and uh, uh, 
Captain Sullivan remained remained a captain until 1882. He was he was the man that that drove the investigation, and all the all the officers reported to him. Uh, the the officer that Charles McCormick that uh, that uh, William Howard was was handcuffed to when they when they took him out to Francis Street. He became captain in 1885 and served in the police department until 1892. And uh, uh, it turns out that uh, Cecilia Oakes, she recovered from her, her uh, trauma. Uh, I'm sure that uh, this never left her. I'm sure that there, that, you know, we talk about PTSD and things like that today. And I'm sure she was affected for the rest of her life, but physically she recovered and uh, uh, she married when she was in her early twenties. She had four children and uh, she lived to be 62, dying of cancer at that time. She's buried in Holy Sepulchre Cemetery. Uh, and uh, purposely not using her married name because I, Pretty certain she still has has uh, descendants in Rochester, and uh, uh, so uh, I think I think the uh, the takeaway from this is that uh, you know, we have this. I think we have this kind of wild west idea of what the police departments and sheriff's offices were like in the nineteenth century, and 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 this sort of this sort of uh, puts a lie to that. Um, Sheriff Campbell was determined not to, let, not to let this crowd get a hold of the prisoner. He did say at the coroner's inquest that if it had been his daughter, the prisoner never would have seen the inside of the jail and uh, said that publicly and it was recorded at, at, the, at the coroner's inquest. But uh, he said that he was elected to uphold the law and he, and he would do it at all hazards. And, and he did. And I think he made, uh, made some good decisions about uh, bringing in extra people and uh, uh, did what he needed to do to uh, uh, quell this, this disturbance. Um, some of the newspapers reported as many as 10,000 people that were on, on site and some more like six or 8,000. I think the real number is more like, more like four or 5,000, including the spectators. Uh, but a major incident in, in, in Rochester history and uh, uh, one that, that, that caused a lot of uh, reverberations in the city at that time. Um, they, uh, they, they did a very thorough inquest of this thing, questioning everybody that was involved with this thing. And uh, the, 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 uh, the, the inquest, the, corn, the county coroner determined that uh, um, Everything that needed to be done was done, and uh, so I think it's I think it's uh, probably it probably doesn't say a lot for uh, that mob mentality in Rochester in 1872, but I think I think the police and the sheriff's office uh, and even the militia uh, um, acquitted themselves very well through this through this thing, but it was reported in newspapers across the entire United States beyond the New York Times and beyond New York State. Um, I, I, we have lots of newspaper databases now and uh, you, can, you can go back and look at, you, you put in keywords for this thing and you can you get hundreds of hits where newspapers in every state in the United States reported on this, on this incident in Rochester. So, um, and national, national uh, uh, papers like Frank Leslie's Illustrated newspaper, you can see, reported on this and uh, at at length, and uh, and some of them sensationalized this way beyond way beyond reality, as you can see in this this picture. Uh, but uh, I think I think you know we have uh, we have lots of people uh, at the Friends of Mount Hope, and and I'm sure downtown at the uh, uh, local history division, and, and and we all operate as public historians, and 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 if you don't know what that means, it's, it's sort of the it's sort of the opposite of a of an academic historian. You know, public historians serve at uh, public history sites. Uh, they serve as as town and village historians. Um, 
uh, they, they write, they're people that don't have uh, academic appointments necessarily, but, but operate, as, uh, operate as historians to, to one degree or another. And uh, one of our board members a number of years ago uh, used to come into our board meetings and, and she would always have, she'd always have something that she had found in the, in the preceding month. And sometimes, sometimes they weren't huge things but she was always very excited about whatever she had found. And another board member sort of quietly said to me, you know, what, what the hell difference does it make? And I, and I explained to him, you know, said, you know this public history uh, is, is, is made up of brick upon brick upon brick of detail. And sometimes as you, as you build this story with these bricks, sometimes it all comes clear. And I think this is a good example of that, where, where uh, the research into this has to be done in newspapers of the day and uh, uh, primary source records, cemetery records, things like that. So uh, with that, uh, does anybody have any questions? Well, Dennis, I do have a couple of questions that have already come in in chat. Mm -hmm. uh, the first two are from Judy Toyer. <clears throat> uh, the first question, could you please provide more information on Howard's trial? For example, was the trial at night or during the day? How was the jury selected? And were there Blacks or people of color on the jury? Uh, yes, the, the, trial, the trial began at midnight on January 4th. There were no Blacks on the jury. Uh, and the way they would choose the jury, you know, the last time I was on jury duty, my, my number on the summons was 600 and 690 or something like that. So they're calling, they're calling over 700 jurors uh, to fill the, the juries that need to be filled. In 1872, uh, they would not have called any jurors. They would have, the sheriff would have gone out on the street or go out, go out into the neighborhood and he would, have, he would have commandeered people to serve on that jury. So the jury was made up of people that were selected uh, sort of at random or maybe not so randomly from, from uh, the citizens in town, people that were available that the sheriff could tap on the shoulder and, uh, and, and bring in. And that's how juries were, were selected at that time because there wasn't a trial every day in the courts. You know, we, we have courts that operate, you know, uh, five days, sometimes more, every week. And uh, in 1872, there, there were the courts did not operate uh, every single day. So there was no need for an enormous jury pool. So there was no standing system to bring in jurors. But, but no, there were no Blacks on the jury. A second question from uh, Ms. Toyer. Um, did black men have the problem of not being able to find work that would exist today? Uh, it, it, it depends, and that, uh, it depends. And it depends on the state of the economy. In 1872, things were going pretty well. You know, we're in that period of American history, uh, post-Civil War, that historians refer to as the roller coaster economy. There's, there's, there are no uh, checks and balances on the economy. So, so there would be low, there would be periods of, of great prosperity, and then an economic collapse. And in 1872, when this was going on, we're we're about a year out from a total collapse of the of the economy. But in 1872, uh, there probably were people that were ready to work. There probably was, was no problem, uh, in, uh, no problem finding a job. And and I would I would venture to say that. Uh, uh, the vast majority of African Americans that lived in, in this area at that time were working or were in their own businesses. And uh, William Howard is a special case. He had been, he had already been in prison. He, by most accounts and by the accounts of his family, he had never made much of an effort to work and had, uh, had uh, been something of a grifter and uh, dependent on his, on his mother's largesse to finance his lifestyle. But be, when he committed this crime, he was only, he was only a week out of prison 
for his previous crime, which I think was was uh, uh, something like a grand larceny or something like that. He he had he had been in trouble all his life, all of his short life because he was not very old. Um, so I don't think he represents the African American community in this area at that time in history. You know, Frederick Douglass was was uh, had probably moved to Washington by this time. He he moved in in early. He, he may have still been here, but uh, uh, I I found I found no comment from Frederick Douglass on this. Uh, if he did, uh, if he did have an opinion on it, I I didn't find it. Um, and uh, and people in the African American community were very cooperative with the authorities in in um, in, in getting Howard arrested. There was no, you know, he's not here or anything when they, when they, when the police showed up in, in Penfield, they, they opened the door and let them, let them right in. And uh, they, um, it's doubtful, they, they didn't know for sure that he was there. It's doubtful that they would have just broken into the house and, and searched it themselves. Uh, I don't know that, but, but it, it sounds like they had several places to search and this was just one of them. So, uh, and uh, that area out there, uh, I don't think there were a lot, but there, there, were, there were several uh, African-American families that lived out there in that section of Penfield off Landing Road. One of them was, as I said, one of them was David Wyckoff's family who were very well thought of. And, and, uh, and, and Howard had, had reported, he had, he had told, uh, told one of the police officers that questioned him that he was going out to the Wyckoff house. Well, it turns out that he didn't. He went out to somebody else's house who I think he thought might help him hide. That wasn't the case. So a, a bit of follow-up information to your comment there about mm -hmm. uh, Frederick Douglass's uh, response. As Lisa Kleeman points out in a comment below, uh, Frederick Douglass's house, Frederick Douglass's house in Rochester uh, did still stand at that time. It burned in June of 1872. Okay. Um, but I'll add that by that point, uh, Douglas had actually been living in Washington, D.C. most of the time since about 1867, 1868. Yeah. Um, interesting he didn't comment on it, though, in his newspaper he was running at that time in D.C. Um, so let me go back. We have one last question from Judy Toyer, and that is, did the newspaper state Howard's dress was too flashy? If not, uh, how did you come to that conclusion? And was the dress in question different from the quote dandies unquote of the era? Um, I don't know. I don't know how much different it was, and I would be I would be about a hundred percent sure that race played into this. Um, there there wasn't an enormous African American community in Rochester at the time. Um, it was probably in the it was probably you know just in a few hundreds at that time. So uh, uh, an African American man would probably would probably be uh, relatively identifiable at that point uh, in a th at that location. But uh, I doubt that his dress was any flashier than the dandies of the day. But the the newspapers, uh, although for 1872, I think they showed a lot of restraint. Uh, one of the, the the Democrat and Chronicle reporters. Uh, that uh, that wrote an article on the on the fourth. Uh, they were they were writing about that. The first article comes out on the first reporting on or comes out reporting on the uh, assault, uh, and then they wrote about this every day. The report the 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 article on the third. This is before the trial. Um, uh, commented that uh, uh, William Howard's uh, deeds should not be uh, seen as any blacker than anybody anybody with a different skin color. So they were thinking along the same lines that, uh, that there was a certain amount of prejudicial uh, opinion about, about him. Um, I, don't, I don't really think in this case that, that he was just scooped, off off the, scooped up off the street because he was black. I think there was a lot of solid evidence that he had committed this crime. Uh, but, uh, but yes, I'm, I'm absolutely certain. I doubt that there would be a, 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 a huge group of people surrounding the jail calling for him to be brought out to be lynched if it had been a, a, a white suspect that had, had committed this crime. 
so yes, I, 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 I would, I would agree with you that there's, there's a racial uh, element to this. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Marjorie Searle, who asks, are there other records of attacks on children? There is, there was one, there was one, uh, there was one in, in the same time period, probably within, within just several months before where uh, somebody broke into uh, a house where a, a young teenage girl uh, was home by herself and uh, she was able to, she was able to get away from him. And uh, so we don't know, we don't know how serious that would have been um, had she not been able to run from the house and, and get help. But uh, the perpetrator of that incident was never caught. But I don't believe it was, I don't believe the perpetrator was an African American. Um, uh, but the, uh, the police took that very seriously as well and did, did investigate and, and look for somebody. They weren't able to find anybody. And uh, um, in, in the 19th century, if you committed a crime, uh, if, if you weren't dumb as a post and you, you, you got out of town and never came back, it would be very hard to track you down. You know, there, there, we're not even using, we're not using fingerprinting systems yet. The Bertillon system of uh, physical features hadn't even been developed yet or wasn't being used in most police departments. Um, you're, depending on, uh, you're depending on people's general description of, of, of these suspects. So it, it would be very difficult to uh, track somebody down if they'd gotten very far from the scene of the crime or if there hadn't been numerous witnesses. I think, I think uh, Howard's mistake was uh, was was you know not uh, keeping a low profile. I, I I'm glad he was caught because I, I I have every confidence that he committed this crime. Once again, I don't think it I don't think it represents um, I don't think it represents the African American community, and I don't I don't think that people at that time thought of African Americans as as any more um, criminal criminal than anybody else. At least not in not in not not in Rochester. This is such a small town. People knew these people. They worked with them. They they were you know they, they saw them on a regular basis. So um, Howard's is a different different case. Thank you. So our next question is from Lisa Kleeman. This is a great question. Um, she's curious how this would have been reported on in the Rochester German newspapers of the day. Uh, Dennis, have you looked into this, or she's wondering if anyone else has checked this out, or would be willing to translate some articles on it? I haven't. I haven't looked at the German newspapers. I uh, can read a little German, but not enough to probably probably not enough to to make sense of it. And uh, um, but uh, I suspect that the German newspapers were a little more critical of the suspect and. Uh, um, probably were not wild that the uh, that that steps were taken so strongly but I, I I'd be interested to I'd be interested if somebody uh, uh, were to to do that work I, I may try it myself I will add if anyone's interested in that that the library does have a large collection of German language newspapers they have all been digitized and are available through historic <clears throat> New York newspapers so if someone would like to look into it, um, I actually have to double check myself and see if there are papers for 1872 in that collection. There are some missing years, but they are all available electronically. If anyone would like to follow up on this. Yeah. Uh, let, let me add one more thing. Sheriff Campbell, who I think comes out sort of the hero in this whole thing because he was a, he was a good administrator. And uh, I think he prevented a lot more, a lot more mayhem than, than occurred. Sheriff Campbell, uh, his term ended in 1873. His son, uh, his son Charles Campbell, ran for sheriff and was elected, and then appointed his father, the former sheriff, as his undersheriff. So, you know, that, that maybe a window on politics at that time. They're all Republicans. They're they're uh, uh, running in a basically a Republican town at that time. You know. Um, 
as far as the, the racial things, you have, I think you have to remember too that, that we're still, 1872, we're still in reconstruction. You know, people are thinking about, uh, about the ending of slavery. And, uh, um, and although, you know, we like to think that Rochester was a, was a, a huge abolitionist town and it was, it didn't represent the, the opinions of everybody in town. There were a wide variety of, of, of opinions on slavery. There were people that thought that, that, uh, that it should be abolished and that, that African-Americans were, were the equal of every other race. There were people that thought that uh, um, slavery should be abolished and that, uh, but, but that, that African-Americans weren't equal to everybody else. There were people that on the other end that thought that slavery was fine and, and we shouldn't have gotten into a war about it. So, so there's a wide variety of attitudes about, about race in, uh, in, even in Rochester. Absolutely. Uh, just a quick follow up on the newspapers before we move to the next question. Mm -hmm. um, I did just check and the Rochester Technical Beobachter, which was the German paper of the day is available on NYS historic newspapers uh, from our collection. So okay. everyone knows. Um, the next question comes from Karen Lankisoffer. Uh, what public comments did the city's administration, mayor, et cetera, at the time make about the events, if they are recorded? Um, most of it is what you would expect from from political uh, political officers. You know, they they condemned the crime, uh, they condemned the uh, uh, the riot and the mayhem. They were concerned about how this looked to people outside the city because other other newspapers from outside of this area uh, um, were fairly critical of Rochester. They, they, they thought that, that the city that they thought was a paragon of, of uh, efficiency and uh, peaceful living had, had deteriorated into, into something that wasn't. And, uh, uh, but uh, I don't think that, the, I don't think there was, uh, I don't think they got too far into it. You know, I think they, they were mostly political, politically related comments. Um, there were uh, a couple of the witnesses were actually former aldermen in, in, in the city, and uh, which which sort of added to the weight of the uh, identifications because they they had they were familiar with with William Howard and and identified him as being in the neighborhood, and and one of them even saw William Howard with Cecilia. Uh, uh, shortly before the time of the, the attack. Interesting. Uh, our next question is from Barbara. Uh, why were the bodies of notorious convicts soaked in lye before burial? Um, I, I think these were, these were people that they, um, that had committed really heinous crimes. And I think they were worried that, uh, that People would come and and uh, do something gruesome with these bodies, you know, either uh, desecrate the, the graves or, or or something like that. And, uh, and that was common practice, not just at Auburn Prison, but but at other places around the country, to protect these graves. You know, remember too that uh, um, just it wasn't too many years before that that uh, Lincoln's grave had been disturbed in Illinois. You know, they, they were trying to steal Lincoln's corpse and hold it for ransom. So, so it wasn't without concern, I guess, that, that they, they were thinking these, these thoughts. Interesting. Um, we have a couple of comments here uh, in a row regarding uh, the location um, in the Dugway area that you talked yeah. about. Um, so the first comment from Joyce Herman questions, was that section Brighton or Penfield? It is now Brighton. I know it's Brighton now. And uh, I, I don't know how far you have to go down into the Dugway for it to become Penfield. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know. And uh, the boundary lines for some of these, some of these towns, in particular the city, were, were in flux at that time. Sure. But they, the newspapers universally reported it as Penfield. Okay, there's a follow up point here that if you're talking about rich, the Rich's Dugway area, it's in Brighton, right at the Penfield border, which is yeah. around Dequay Creek itself. Right. And, 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 you know, the same, the same uh, uh, thing may be happening in 1872 that happens today where people say, oh, I live in Rochester. 
they really live in a rondequoit or gates or mm. something like that. So, um, absolutely. Uh, there is a follow up to the talk about lie that I do want to mention before going on to other mm -hmm. questions. This is again from Marjorie Searle. Um, a horrendous crime was committed in Western New York only a few years ago where the perpetrator put the bodies in barrels and covered them with lye um, as a way to prevent identification of the bodies. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, where do you think that person got that idea? You know, um, they're trying to prevent identification in this case, but uh, uh, that wasn't the purpose of the uh, prison officials and people like that. They didn't want, they, they, they didn't want these these graves uh, disturbed or or made uh, some sort of uh, uh, some sort of pilgrimage to these things and and you know I mean people are people can be a little nuts now I guess in 1872 they could be a little nuts as well yeah some things don't change right um, there, there's another good point here actually just an interesting point here from Ronald Wood that alkaline hydrolysis or aquamation is an ecologically preferable method to cremation. In other yeah. words, literally the breakdown of body by lie. Right. And Desmond Tutu, who just passed, has chosen this method. Right. And 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 basically, basically the remains would have been poured into the grave. Yeah. And that's that's what they did. And uh, you know, even today, you know, the graves of prisoners are not identified by name. Um, for that, for, for a lot of the same reasons, you know, you just don't, you don't want somebody making a martyr out of these people. On the other hand, you don't want somebody who, who really uh, um, has some personal uh, animus with these people to go out there and do something either. So, so it's, it's probably for the best. I would have to agree. Um, going back to the riot itself, we have a mm -hmm. question from Douglas Fisher who says, you said that the crowd at the jail got larger when they approached from Court Street with the mill race not in the way. Did some of the crowd actually cross the mill race? Was, was the mill a, race yes. water running in January? It was, it was, but there was a bridge across the mill race to get to the jail. So they could, they could, they could pretty much control that once they got people back across it. Uh, it was the Court Street bridge that was the problem. As you can see on that, you can see on that map, this is this is the mill race, but Court Street is over here. Court Street, Court Street, uh, there was a bridge across across the mill race, just as there was a bridge across the river. And so, if you got up, if you got up across across the river part, you could you could come down into this area and and approach the jail directly. Plus, there were people in both of these lumber yards. There were people that climbed up on top of piles of wood, and they were, you know, these were big industrial-sized lumber yards. So there were people that were climbing up on top, and they had, uh, and they were above the level of the uh, of the officers protecting the jail. So there's a lot of concern about that. You know, the, no, the police would never let that happen today. Uh, but uh, um, I think that. Uh, I think the sheriff was taken by surprise at the at the response to this thing, and uh, um, and once again, there just aren't that many uh, there aren't that many deputies and there aren't that many city policemen um, to take care of it. Yeah. Thus, the you know calling out the militia, and it, it's 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 it was the second time that Sheriff Campbell had had to call out the militia because there was a there was a, a riot. Uh, uh, previous to this, a couple of years before, um, and it was it was more it was it was a labor labor dispute, but the sheriff called out the militia previously to this. <clears throat> I, I do want to add regarding the mill races, um, the race in question here is the Rochester Fitzhugh and Carroll race. It's the biggest of all of Rochester's mill races. It's basically a man-made river. Um, it would have been a formidable barrier to people crossing it. And the mills yep. did run year round. So it would have been, unless it froze over, would have been a running, massive running body of water. So that bridge was absolutely necessary. Right. Um, and Douglas actually has a follow up question here, since it's not apparent on the map. Do you know where the bridge was across the mill race? Not the Court Street Bridge, but the other bridge. Do you I think I think the bridge is down here. 
and they, the, and they, they came across that and then breached the yard. Uh, and, and we're able to get, we're able to surround the jail. That's, that's before the sheriff could, could get control of that yard because, because he was, he was, uh, um, he was injured in the, in the course of this thing too, as they, as he was pressed up against the, the wall to the, to the building. And uh, several deputies uh, were, were seriously injured in this thing, which is, which is testament to the fact that, that, you know, the restraint that was shown because all of these men were armed. And uh, um, I'm sure if you're facing, if you're facing a hundred uh, uh, violent people, you're, you're probably not going to shoot because you're not going to get a second chance. Uh, but, but, you know, once he had his forces arrayed there, um, um, it, it, I, I think it showed great restraint that, that more force wasn't used. Absolutely, especially by the standards of the time. Right. Um, this the, next question, oh, go ahead. The, the, the people that were killed and the people that were injured were hit with, basically these were mini balls, the sort of thing that they used during the Civil War because these were Civil War era muskets that most of these guys were carrying. Yeah. <clears throat> Very nasty wounds at close range. Yes. Um, our next question is from Neil Jashik. Sorry if I mispronounced your last name and I've got to be honest, this is a brutally honest question. I'm surprised that an African-American convicted of raping a young white girl did not get the death penalty. Did he have a good lawyer? Uh, he had a lawyer. Um, I, I, I'm not so sure that uh, his, I'm not so sure his lawyer was overly enthusiastic about his defense, but uh, but this is what the statute called for in, in terms of a penalty. If he had killed her, uh, you know, it, it would have called for the death penalty. But uh, but she survived, so it's it's basically an assault. I don't know what the uh, I don't I don't know what the laws were called at that time. You know, for example, today, uh, first degree murder is reserved for the murder of a police officer, corrections officer. Second degree murder is basically premeditated murder. And uh, but but that was different back then. First degree murder was premeditated. So so these laws were probably probably different. But but he got um, he got the maximum. A penalty for that crime at, at that point in New York State history. Okay. Um, so our next question is another question from Karen Lankisoffer. How could a family member who wanted to visit the prisoner's grave identify it? Was the family told what the number of its relative's grave was? Absolutely. The, the, the family would have, would have been privy to that information. Um, and, and, you know, uh, probably other people would too. They just didn't want, they didn't want it to become uh, widespread because it, it, it would cause problems. Some of these prisoners were not buried in the prison cemetery as well. You know, there are a lot of prisoners who died in the, in the custody of, of, of Auburn prison that would have been buried in their hometowns in their family plots. Probably, you know, in the case of Mount Hope, we have examples where there are no monuments to those people, people that that uh, uh, either died in the, in the commission of their crime or or were um, um, or were hung for their for their their crimes here and are buried in in the uh, cemetery, mostly in the mostly in what's called the public ground. We don't have any place that was called the pauper's lot, but but it, that's basically what it is. Uh, this, this next question is a great question. Uh, it's from Bob Herman. Why was the jail called the Blue Eagle Jail? Called the Blue Eagle Jail because in, uh, in the 1830s, uh, uh, a man was, was uh, incarcerated for a week for debt when New York State was, was still putting people in jail for debt. And he was, uh, he was an actor in one of the theaters and uh, a creative guy. And while he was, while, while he was spending his week in, 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 in the jail, he wrote a little poem on the wall comparing the jail to the Eagle Hotel, which sat at the corner of, of Main and State Street. And, but he called it the Blue Eagle Jail uh, as a comparison. 
and uh, uh, commenting on the accommodations and whatever. And, and, and the name stuck. Uh, it, it was called the Blue Eagle Jail until the day they tore it down in 1885. It also, of course, became involved in a very well-known popular song of the mid 19th century. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Uh, we have two questions from Phyllis Stam. Uh, were any of the involved cast of characters buried in Mount Hope? Yes. Uh, Harry Merlot was buried in Mount Hope, one of the victims of the, of the militia firing. And uh, uh, um, uh, the other victim is, is, is not. I don't know where he's buried. And he may not have, he, 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 he may be buried out of town because that, that's fairly common too. Um, if he had family elsewhere, he was here alone. He may have been. He may have been taken back to his family plot and wherever he came from. Um, I don't know where he's buried. Um, a lot of the people that were involved in this thing, uh, I think. Sher I think. Uh, I think Sheriff Campbell's buried in Mount Hope. I think. Uh, I know that uh, Chief Sherman is buried in Mount Hope. Um, a lot of the people that were involved in this thing are, are buried there. Uh, a lot of the militia commanders, people like that. And I'm sure I'm sure a, a bunch of the police officers and and militiamen are, are buried in Mount Hope. Uh, Phyllis also asks, where were you able to research the court case? The, the court case is reported in the in the newspaper, and the, there's 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 no transcript of the of the of the court case, and I, I'm not so sure that they. Uh, trials, criminal trials like this, I'm not so sure they even did transcripts at that time. You know, uh, there was, there was no, I don't believe there was an official transcript to Susan B. Anthony's trial in 1873. And that's in the federal court, but, uh, but there were enough people there taking notes and, you know, reporters who, who would take it down in shorthand. And, and Susan B. Anthony actually published the what, you know, what, what became the transcript for, the, uh, for her trial. But not every trial had a transcript. A lot of the, there's a lot of changes in the court system, and that's one of them after the state constitution has changed in the 1880s. <clears throat> um, there's a great point here that Sally makes, just going back to burials of criminals. Yep. That uh, John Wilkes Booth is buried in his family plot in Baltimore but without a stone mm -hmm. for the reasons you came into. Didn't yep. the family did not want people to find and desecrate his grave? Right, and and you know people's uh, sensibilities about scandal were much different in the 19th century than they are now. Uh, the, the when I talked about Emma Moore uh, at mm -hmm. at the presentation in the fall, um, Emma Moore's grave is not not uh, marked. And, and I, I don't think anybody in this day and age would accuse her of, of being the uh, author of her own demise. Uh, but uh, unless, of course, she committed suicide, we don't, we don't really know that. But, uh, but her grave was never marked and her family, her family was uh, um, fairly well off. They certainly could have afforded a, a monument, but they didn't. So, the last question I have thus far is again from Judy Toyer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit of a longer question. Um, in 1872, when his Rochester home was destroyed by what he believed to be arson, Frederick Douglass said that although Rochester had some good people, Rochester also had a, quote, KKK spirit, unquote, that he thought was behind the arson. Mm -hmm. Was that sentiment about African Americans at work in the attempted lynching of Howard? Uh, I, I, I suspect it was. Um, I think that part of this is um, part of the part of the most violent part of this thing uh, were these these uh, younger German American men who who felt that this was an insult to their community and, and felt very strongly about about this assault. Uh, it wasn't bad enough that, that this young girl was assaulted, that, that this German American girl was assaulted. And I think there's that element to it. And that's the, because most of the newspapers reported that uh, a number of the number of the people that were intensely 
uh, attacking the jail uh, were, were German, German Americans. That, that community was substantial in Rochester at that time. You know, many of the German Americans came uh, about the time the Irish were coming in the eight, late 1840s and 1850s. So it was a substantial size community. But I think there's, I, I, I would not underestimate the, the racial component to that. I will say from my own study of, of related topics that German Americans had a reputation for being very strongly anti-slavery in the pre-Civil War era. Mm -hmm. But being anti-slavery does not mean that you were not potentially racist as a community or would bring right. race into account in a situation like this in 19th century America. It's a very complicated discussion. Yeah, and the, the, the scale of, of the scale, you know, a scale that we would recognize today uh, about racism is not the scale that was in effect in the late 19th century. And uh, I, I don't say that as an excuse for anybody, but it, it's something, you know, if you study this history, it's something that, that needs to factor in, you know, about, about what, what was considered extreme and what was maybe a little more mainstream. Absolutely. But I think generally in Rochester, and I think Frederick Douglass was right, certainly he would know, but I think that uh, a, substantial, uh, a substantial part of the community accepted the African-Americans in this community. They were part of the community. Uh, they, uh, they were their customers. They, they, they worked with them, um, knew them. As I said, it wasn't that big a town. 60 or 62,000 people about that time. Do we have any other questions? Hold on here a moment and see if anyone would like to ask any final questions of Dennis. I will say while we're waiting, I've had a couple people ask about recordings. Um, we are, of course, recording this. The recording will become available on the Rochester Public Library YouTube page within a few days, uh, hopefully by the end of this coming week. I, I, I also say that I, I, would be, I would be very interested if anybody has any uh, special knowledge of this or any of the things we've talked about, I'd be, I'd be certainly be interested in hearing from them. Uh, and, uh, you know, they can, they can, you know, email the Friends of Mount Hope or they, or, you know, or email me direct if they, if they my email is, is out there at the U of R. So um, I'd be interested to hear uh, people's take on this or, or as I said, if they have any special knowledge that applies to what we've been talking about. Well, Dennis, I don't see any more questions coming in, but I want to echo a number of comments that have been made about how interesting and in-depth your presentation was. Thank you so much for joining us as a presenter again today. Thank you. And thank you to all of you who joined us online. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now.